Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me just start by sharing screen because I'm going to be talking through a set of slides. There are 25 slides. Uh, we can scoot through some of them quite quickly. Others are quite important. Uh, but I do tend to um, stay fairly closely to the PowerPoint slides, which are available at the imaw.org site afterwards. Let's start by saying, who am I? And how may I have the, how do I have the audacity to profess any knowledge of expert determination? Well, this is who I am. I've been a chartered accountant just over half a century, which is sobering. I was a general practitioner for 20 years, started my own practice, built it up and up until I became a partner in an international firm. During that process in 1989, having had more than my share of audits and tax returns and boring, boring clients, I started doing forensic work. So for the last 30 years, I've done forensic work. I've been a mediator 32 years. I've been an expert determiner accredited since 2009, although I'd been doing that work for many years before that. I was in fact in the first group of five experts to be accredited by the Academy of Experts, which is as far as I'm aware, the only professional body which provides this accreditation. Uh, I've done about 30, 35 expert, determinant, expert determinations, mainly share company share sale purchase disputes, because of course I am a chartered accountant, but some quite interesting ones, which uh, you may perhaps not have thought an accountant would be capable of addressing. So that's my credentials. Hopefully I do know what I'm talking about, but we'll see. Why do you need to know about expert determination? Well, you may be a lawyer, another professional, a business person or individual, who has or may in future have a dispute in your life. And of course, we are talking from the mediator network and one has to say with sincerity that mediation is an excellent form of, ex of dispute resolution. And the mediator network has an excellent stable of mediators available to serve you. But if the mediation doesn't settle, the minority, very small minority, don't, you may have to start again. Whereas expert determination, ED, I'll save time by calling it ED, having many of the consensual characteristics of mediation does have one very important difference. The decision at the end is binding. You do have finality to your dispute. So in this session, we will address what is ED? How does it differ from other forms of ADR? How to get the appointment right? Because the engagement letter is in fact the contract between the expert and the parties. And should the determiner, the appointed expert, stay within their expertise? On that, I'm going to get rid of that suggestion very quickly. The answer is absolutely not. Some years ago, there was a lady, chartered accountant, appointed to determine a dispute. And she said, I can't decide everything at, at large because I am only an accountant. The court disagreed with her. You are not only an accountant, you are the expert appointed to determine this dispute. So you must determine everything. You may engage experts and other professionals to help you, but you have to make the decision. So we're then going to look at procedure, what, are, what rules we should perhaps adopt, and then what is included in the final decision, the determination. That's the agenda, let's go for it. What is expert determination? It's where an independent expert is appointed by the parties to resolve a dispute. The decision is legally binding between the parties. It usually arises from a contractual dispute, but it can be used where there was no contract originally. For instance, I did one some time ago, which was to do with how much to pay out to a retiring senior partner of a legal practice. They'd been to see an arbitrator, an arbitrator had made an award, but only in general principles, 
and there had to be some numbers put onto it. So I was appointed ED to decide the amount. And it involved things like valuing the law library, the boardroom furniture, and so on and so forth. And in fact, I could have resolved that whole dispute without the arbitrator at all, and at about a third of the overall cost of the two of us. Expert determination, like mediation is confidential and fairly quick, I would say fairly quick. My longest took seven years, but only because we were asking the tax commissioners for a decision on riots, res reservation of interest in overseas trusts, which was a very clever way of getting remuneration out of a company without paying tax. It didn't work. So that took seven years. Conversely, a company sale purchase dispute I did quite recently was done start to finish in, would you believe, five days. Everybody was teed up for it. We just got on with it. It's relatively inexpensive. I'm not, exp I'm not inexpensive, but I'm not, I'm not expensive. Um, and unlike mediation, it is binding. So, is expert determination therefore alternative dispute resolution? Possibly, but probably not. Because ADR covers many forms of dispute resolution everything, some would say, other than litigation and arbitration. In most forms of ADR, and one would say as a purist, in all forms of ADR, it is the parties who have the final decision. ED is generally referred to as an ADR process, but in purist terms it is not, because it is essentially a contractually based form of dispute resolution not governed by statute. The agreement is enforceable under contract law and it's very difficult to challenge a properly carried out determination. This is the book on expert determination. John Kendall on expert determination. Edition one was about 80 pages. It's grown a bit. It is full of cases where people have tried to challenge an expert's decision. The generality of those where the challenge has succeeded is where the expert really hasn't carried out the job that he said he would do. Otherwise, the volume of case law on ED is very slim. I have an article on this on the Chartered Accountants website with the very snappy address that you see there. These slides will be published and you will be able to go onto that link more conveniently than your photographic memory trying to remember all those blue letters. How then does ED work? There's an appointment of an expert either under a DRC dispute resolution clause of a contract or by agreement between the parties. There is no fixed procedure. Each case is governed by the terms of the dispute resolution clause or is determined by the contract which appoints the determiner. And when I say the contract, I'm really talking about my own engagement letter. It runs to about 12 or 14 pages. It sets out how I determine, how I decide the dispute is going to be resolved. It can be modified by negotiation between the parties because it's a three-way thing. But once we three, if there are two parties in dispute, agree, that letter is signed off by us three and that is what we have to do. For an accountant, the disputes typically dealt with are completion accounts and earnouts. Now, I see that everyone's on mute and I can't ask you uh, if you know what I'm talking about. I have to assume you do. If not, put a query on chat, but for the moment we'll press on. The terms of the appointment are crucially important. They are vital and they should cover. What issues are to be determined? Any specific procedures which must be followed? The fact that the determination will be final and binding? 
that it would be confidential and that there should or should not be a power by the expert to award interest um, and the basis of, uh, sorry, as well as the dates on which the payment awarded should be paid. So there must be an amount found to be payable and there must be a decision that interest shall run if it isn't paid on time. Chris? Yes. We just had a couple of questions, just not to stop your momentum yeah. there. Um, but could you can, can explain completion accounts and what earnout actually is? Yes, of course. Jeez. I can. Um, in the purchase and sale of a company, the contract is usually referred to as a SPA, SPA, Sale Purchase Agreement. When a company changes hands, Nobody knows what it's worth on the actual day of completion. If you were buying a house, you would know. But with a company, the balance sheet changes every day. The amount in the bank, the amount of for customers, and so on. Everything changes every day. So on the day when the company changes hands, nobody really knows exactly what it's worth. So the procedure is that generally 80 or 90% of what you think the value is going to be is the amount which the purchaser pays to the vendor. And then the vendor's accountant draws up a balance sheet called the completion account a, a week or two afterwards so that the exact value of the company is determined and the, ba the balance of the price is then paid. That balance sheet, the completion accounts, must be agreed between the sellers, the vendor's accountant and the purchaser's accountant. And if they don't agree, that's a dispute. There has to be a procedure for resolving that dispute, which usually involves the appointment of an expert determiner. So the expert determiner then, if you like, sits in court, listens to submissions from both sides, I'll come to that later, and uh, makes then a binding award as to what the value of the company is per the completion accounts, which he has decided are the accurate ones. All right? You all right? Are you all right there, Will? That's wonderful. Thanks, yeah. Chris. Brilliant. And then just, I will explain earnouts because it can be very brief. It's quite often the case that on sale of a company, the existing directors are under contract to work for the company under new ownership for two, three years and to take a share of the profits which are made in that period. And there can be disputes as to whether the company is being run in the same way. For instance, with one that I did, which was a, a national waste disposal company, it took over a waste, dis a waste disposal company in Scotland, which had a very bright sales director. The national group wanted that director, so she was transferred to the group and the sales of the company that was taken over didn't prosper as well because it was without that sales director. One of the things I had to decide was how much would the profit have been if that management team of the company bought uh, had not been reduced by that sales director being transferred. Okay, that's all right. You're muted, Will. Sorry, yes, that's fine, Chris. You, yeah, right. Okay, Thank I'll you. press on then. Um, so, how is a decision made by the expert? Well, it has to follow the procedure which was agreed in the contract at the beginning, my engagement letter as signed by the other parties. Typically, the claimant will submit their case, the defendant will make a response, and the claimant has the right to reply on any matters which have so far arisen. That, when you think about it, is how a court examines a witness. Evidence in chief, cross-examination and re-examination. But in all but the smallest cases, the normal procedure is for both sides to make their submission and responses and replies. So both have an equal chance to bat. And the determiner has to approach his task by deciding 
the relevant facts, deciding the relevant law and applying the law that's been decided to the facts that he's decided. It's all very basic and logical. So, should the expert give reasons when he makes his decision? In favour, one thing is that the losing party will know why they've lost and that their submissions have indeed been taken into account. As against, if reasons are disclosed, that can provide grounds for further argument and ammunition for the losing party to challenge the decision and perhaps take it to court. On balance, I am firmly of the view that it is desirable not to give reasons. The parties want finality. So a non-speaking determination, a re a one without reasons, is generally preferable to a speaking determination with reasons. The determination must be clear and concise. It must define the scope of the dispute and how it has been decided. No unnecessary material, please. And it must, of course, accord with any mechanism sent out in the contract, set out in the contract. Three parties have agreed the job is to be done in a particular way, so it has to be. The determiner should prepare a report containing an introduction, a narrative, his logic and his reasons, what the decision is and what his decision is on costs. Now, I say the determiner should prepare a report. Leave open the idea of who's going to see that. I'll deal with that later. In the introduction, there will be a summary of the contract, any extra provisions which the expert must follow, how he has been appointed, the date when the matter was referred to him and what the expert was asked to do. In the narrative section, well, there we are. It's circumstances, relevant facts, respective arguments, experts' conclusions on the facts and experts' conclusions on any legal points. Costs. If the rules permit it, the expert's costs may be awarded against one side or the other or equally. And also, if the rules permit it, the expert may allocate the costs of the parties one side or the other. Um, very much the same as a High Court action, except that the judge always has those rights. In ED, the expert has those rights only if the rules permit it. And I like these rules because I can penalise people who have really not been fair. And during the process, if there are time wasters, I can say, come along, or I am going to penalise you on costs. So it's a powerful weapon. It aids the efficient process of the dispute. Then in the report, the logic and reasons should be set out by the expert. And now you know what should be included in the expert's report. But non-speaking is preferable and all of the above should be included in a confidential report, which is released to the parties only if they at the beginning had insisted on a speaking determination. If it's a non-speaking determination, no one will ever see that report. So for his own protection, the expert should carefully write such a report just in case his decision is challenged. I can tell you I've written some beautiful reports and no one's ever challenged my decisions, so no one has ever seen them. And isn't that sad? But effective and efficient and what the parties needed. So at the end of having written this beautiful report, 
I would generally write a half page letter to the parties. Dear sirs, your dispute. I am the expert appointed by the dispute to do. I determine this dispute by finding that A must pay to B the sum of pounds X by this date, failing which simple interest shall run at a daily rate of Y percent until paid. I make no award as to costs. I will not enter into any correspondence or communication about any aspect of this my finding. Yours faithfully, goodbye. In fact, I've had one or two thank you letters, uh, even from losing parties, pleasingly. But no one has ever tried to, dis tried to continue that communication with me. That is a final letter, and that's what they wanted. So the decision has to be final. It is to be clear and not ambiguous. It has to be complete so that all the issues at large were determined. And of course, it has to be enforceable. And it is enforceable if it is within the terms of the contract which the parties agreed to at the beginning. What about rules? Rules can be quite lengthy. They may be in the dispute resolution clause, so you'd have to adopt those if they are. That is rare. I very much like rules drawn up by the Academy of Experts. I know I have to declare an interest. I am a fellow, one of the very few fellows of the Academy, and I am very fond of them. They do an excellent job. And they have a set of rules which they publish for free, which are settled by council. I adopt them. I have to adopt them by the engagement letter I keep referring to, uh, which includes various things like the charging procedure and that sort of thing. But the rules otherwise are fully comprehensive and you will get them from that link. But you must have rules. There's no amateurism about this. It has to be done properly. Can you challenge the expert's decision? Well, I want to start by talking briefly about the case of Begum and Hossein, because it's really interesting. These were two ladies, Indian ladies, obviously, who ran an Indian restaurant, obviously. They were 50% shareholders each in the company which owned this restaurant. One wanted to sell to the other, and an expert was appointed to determine the price that should be paid. The terms under which that expert was appointed include that he was obliged not just to look at the official books of account of the business, but also at the handwritten record of takings. I think we are getting an idea as to the sort of business it was two sets of books, one for the taxman, one for the people themselves, which is a bit naughty, but it does happen. The ex and it had to be a non-speaking determination. The expert made his award. He started by giving reasons. He said, um, I'm going to give reasons. That's the first thing that went against the contract he'd entered into because he hadn't to give reasons. He then said, I've decided not to look at the handwritten records because they were far too complicated and I didn't understand them and so I just relied on the official books of account. And he said that despite the fact that under the uh, engagement terms he was allowed to engage the help of a forensic accountant if he wished and that accountant's fees would have to be paid by the parties. So frankly he made a mess of the whole thing. And what did he do? He basically didn't do what he was told. He didn't do what he was contracted to do. And so the court found that the whole process had to start again with a different expert. And what I've not managed to work out is, was that expert ever paid? I doubt it. By the way, for the record, he was not a chartered accountant, I'm pleased to say. And then I turn to the dear old Lord Denning. Now I can't imitate his warm Gloucestershire 
accent, but in a very important case called Campbell and, Ad Campbell and Edwards, where he was asked to decide whether <coughs> the decision of the expert must be accepted by the parties, he said yes. Why? And these are his reasons. It is simply the law of contract. If two persons agree that the price of a property should be fixed by a valuer on whom they agree, and he gives that valuation honestly and in good faith, they are bound by it. Even if he has made a mistake, they are still bound by it. The reason is because they have agreed to be bound by it. Of course, if there were fraud or collusion, it would be very different. Fraud or collusion unravels everything. I love those words. But that apart, look at the rest of that paragraph. The parties wanted finality, not challenges to a decision, and they got it. And Lord Denning agreed the expert's decision had to stand. So if you want an expert determiner, how do you find one? It's suitable for virtually any dispute, but mainly those arising from contract, which would tell you what sort of an expert you would want. Does the contract specify what ED should be chosen or do the parties agree to it? Now, the next bit is crossed out. You will probably ask why. The answer is I have some irritation to share with you here. There are about 156,000 chartered accountants in English chartered accountants, 156,000. About 120 of them, me included, have for many years been on a president's list. So where the president of the ICAW is required to appoint an expert, the secretariat look at the list and appoint one of us. As from the 1st of July, the president has decided he will not, he, in fact, it's like it was a lady last year, Fiona Wilkinson, I know her quite well. They decided that there would be no more president appointments. If a solicitor applied to the president to make an appointment, they should be told, look at the list of members and choose your own. Now, I find that rather annoying because we on that little list, 120 of us remember, out of 156,000, were competent to do this work. Now, anybody can simply tick a list and say, I'm an expert determiner. And I fear there's trouble brewing where incompetent people, maybe excellent auditors or tax advisors, know next to nothing about expert determination and we'll try to do it and we'll muddle through. And I think it's a, a most unfortunate decision. So what I now say is for all disputes, look to the Academy of Experts. It is the only professional body which accredits experts and has a list called expert search from which you may choose. And by the way, if you're interested enough to become an expert determiner, have a look at their website as well because they, they train them. And I, as I mentioned earlier, was in the very first batch of five to achieve that accreditation. There are still very few of us, but it's a rigorous course. If you want a proper expert, that is where to find one. So to sum up, one has to agree, this after all is the mediator network, that mediation is an excellent form of dispute resolution with a very high settlement rate. So you can have confidence in that process. But if you don't settle, you may have to start again or be forced into litigation or arbitration. Very expensive processes. So why not consider ED where you will have a binding decision far quicker and far more cheaply than arbitration or having your day in court. It's a process well worth considering. So, if you have been, thanks very much for listening. 